Hi everyone, I'm Ray Ma. You probably know me as the creator and co-host of Tech Buzz China by Pandaily. It's a bi-weekly podcast focused on giving you a peek into what's buzzing within the tech community in China. On the podcast, we uncover and contextualize unique insights, perspectives, and takeaways on headline tech news that don't always make it into English language coverage, so you can be smarter about the world of China tech. What you probably didn't know is that we also have a paid newsletter called Extra Buzz, and today I'm going to share with you one of our most popular issues on Ant's halted IPO. If you enjoyed this video, please consider signing up for a subscription. At TechBuzzChina.com, Extra Buzz Number Nineteen, Ant Group, the biggest IPO that wasn't. So let's go over the timeline. On August twenty fifth, Ant files for an IPO on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange in the world's largest expected initial public offering. There's a dual listing expected to happen on the Shanghai Stock Exchange. On October twenty fourth, twenty twenty. Jack Ma gives a speech at the Bun Summit. On the same day, Ant's IPO pricing is determined. Fast forward to November second, twenty twenty. Jack Ma and Ant management are summoned for a meeting with regulators, and there are new draft regulations on micro lending released. On November third, twenty twenty, the Ant IPO is halted on both the Hong Kong and Shanghai stock exchanges. So, that's the timeline. I want to start off and explain to you what is the actual product of Ant. If you need a refresher when it comes to Ant, may I suggest our Tech Buzz episode seventy four on the company, which I dare say provides a pretty good context into the history of the company and why it has created the product lines it has, which consists of credit tech at thirty nine percent of revenues, payments at thirty six percent, investment tech sixteen percent. And insure tech eight percent. The names are pretty self-explanatory, but you can always read the draft prospectus, and/or our podcast transcript if you are uncertain. Of these, we can neglect the investment and insure segments for now because they are small, and because they don't pose as much of a risk problem. They still can, of course, as we saw in the case of Yulabal imposing deposit and withdrawal limits to maintain stability and manage liquidity, but that was not an indictment of the product logic itself, and more of a testament to Alipay's distribution power. It was also unlikely to be on the level of taking the entire economy down with it. The important thing is that the revenue split of the business went from primarily payments at fifty-five percent of revenues. To more credit tech, in the span of three years, while growing at a clip of thirty percent per year on the entire overall business, on track to be more than twenty billion dollars this year, just over half of that growth has been contributed by the now largest credit tech business, which more than tripled in the last three years. The credit tech business consists of two main products: Huabei and Jiebei. Which mean just spend and just borrow, respectively, and they are Ant's versions of the credit card and the small loan. Huabei is already the largest consumer credit product line in China, and it offers an annualized interest rate of a bit over fifteen percent, the max under new rules by the Chinese government to cut down usurious loans. Jiebei is much the same. Together, they served over five hundred million users in the last twelve months. Now, let that sink in for a second. Since these products are only available to Alipay users, which has an annual active user of a billion, this means that half of all Alipay users used some kind of Ant credit or debt product in the last year. But it also means that half of all internet users in China, period, used Huabei or Jiebei products in the last year. Next, let's go for some context. Now, of course, Huabei is a short-term credit product with an average outstanding balance of three hundred dollars. So, even if we're looking at five hundred million people using it, so what? You say? Well, it's not a problem until you look at the real distribution of Chinese incomes. As all of you long-term TechBuzz listeners know, there are at least two Chinas. 
the urban globetrotting, latte sipping, luxury goods addicted population gets disproportionate airtime in the West. But most people, i.e. something like 1 billion people, have annual household incomes of less than $15,000. In fact, the average real disposable income is less than $300 per month for two-thirds of Chinese provinces, and that's as of 2015. Sure, the population is mostly concentrated among the 10 or so coastal provinces and municipalities directly under central government control, like Shanghai and Beijing, but you see the problem here. Even a measly $300 of credit is a lot for many parts of China. There is real concern that Ant's products are reaching beyond the credit worthy and going well into the subprime. When I say concern, I'm not talking about the business level impact, which let's assume Ant's excellent finance and legal teams can manage, but the social backlash against such products in general. There's a reason why the Ant IPO halt was mostly applauded by netizens in China. Most people consider these digital credit products a form of predatory lending. They were increasingly uncomfortable with the way these products were being advertised and force-fed to everyone, especially the most vulnerable. Ant was not the only or worst offender. It was the entire industry. There's a few background points you should understand about the consumer finance space in China. Credit cards are very new. There were less than 500,000 in existence in 2002, and they've been growing quickly, but still only a bit over one fifth of the population has one. In fact, as of 2015, 60% of Huawei's customers have never used a credit card. And while there's been a lot done to foster inclusion, there's still the fact that credit can be difficult to come by for many, especially those just starting out. Which is why Ant's assertion in its prospectus that a typical Huawei customer is young and internet savvy, but has unmet consumption demand due to the lack of a credit card or insufficient credit limits is a double-edged sword. Of course, more credit, especially when made available at the point of sale as Ant's products often are, is both a great growth hack and welcomed by consumers for the convenience factor. And let's suppose for a moment we don't believe there's any problem with the way Ant assesses credit risk. There is still the problem that that's not how the Chinese public sees it. Maybe it's because they're new to debt, but a great number of Chinese people see the issue to be more and more young people spending themselves into ever deeper debt and ruining their future. It's a popular viewpoint, and it's not just confined to millennials and older. So now let's talk about the precedence. This is because pretty consistently over the past few years, there has been a whole spate of issues when it comes to unregulated, or at least not well-regulated lending businesses in China. Two episodes have been especially traumatic. One is the P2P lending fiasco we talked about in TechBuzz episode 76, where a lot of people lost a lot of money. That's an estimated $115 billion to dishonest or inexperienced operators. The government finally shut the whole thing down late last year after repeatedly trying to regulate the industry and failing. Of course, it didn't help that some contained state-backed funds and were presumed to be safe by folks such as this lady who killed herself out of despair after losing all her savings. The second are the university lending scandals, which resulted in students committing suicide when they could not deal with the mounting levels of debt they had accumulated, often compounded by the inhumane ways in which collectors were blackmailing them, such as threatening to make public nude photos that the female students sent in as collateral. To many people, these crises, both of which took several years to resolve and are honestly still fresh wounds, shattered their confidence in the ability of lenders or lending platforms to ring in their greed, even at the expense of real lives lost. This was corroborated by the platform's own actions. As the P2P fiasco showed, wherever there is opportunity, thousands will swarm in. E-commerce players such as JD had long followed Ant's lead. Last month, I wrote about how JD Digits filed for IPO soon after Ant. 
and of course Baidu and Tencent are among the leading players. But Meituan, Didi, and even Weibo have jumped in headfirst. Sina Weibo even had a promotion where it was advertised that folks who borrowed money on the platform would get their likes counted multiple times. That wasn't strictly true, but it got people furious at the platform for targeting young fans who are often part of communities that already spent too much money and time trying to get their favorite celebrities trending. That's another extremely controversial activity I've written about on Extra Buzz. And now they were going to go into debt for it. And that's the huge difference between P2P and microlending. P2P, for the most part, was not taken on seriously by the internet giants in China. Their vast distribution networks were primarily being leveraged for advertising purposes, not actual lending. Not so for microlending. To the people, it was as if, instead of here in the US where Google has moved to ban payday loan ads, let's suppose Google decided instead to sell payday loans themselves. <laughs> The internet giants, each with a few hundred DAU, were going after the lending business under the guise of being a big data provider, and doing so with very little oversight. And now for the backlash. If you were on the ground in China, this would have been obvious. Ads were plastered everywhere. Even on bus terminals was a common complaint I read online and heard firsthand, implying that People didn't think bus takers could afford to live with debt. There were lots of spam phone calls and texts. If you open up any short video platform this year, you would have been bombarded with ads or sponsored content that basically tells you, you're an idiot if you don't borrow as much as you can. In early October, when one Huawei commercial implied that a working class father should use his credit advance to give his daughter a presentable birthday, the internet erupted in fury. And three weeks ago, when Li Xueqin, a female stand-up comedian phenom, made a viral joke where she planned to buy the entirety of Alibaba for Singles Day by borrowing funds on Huawei. Of course, this makes no actual sense, but its popularity is just one more indication that the public had thought debt-fueled consumerism was getting out of control to the point of utter absurdity. Of course, this is not to say that there weren't folks who were on Ant's side. Of course, this is not to say that there weren't folks who were on Ant's side. As we covered on TechBuzz, there is indeed a dearth of financing opportunities available to some very deserving borrowers, especially small businesses. And this is a problem that's been highlighted for years. So Jack Ma was not wrong that many parts of the Chinese banking system with their pawn shop mentality were not equipped to deal with them. But the 20 million small business borrowers only make up a minority or 20% of Ant's loans outstanding. And there was middle ground. You could criticize the banks and appreciate Ant's existence, but still believe it needed to be reined in. There is a balance. And I think this is exactly what happened. And now for the speech. Let's go back to Jack Ma's ill-fated speech at the Bun Summit on October 24th, the gist of which I translated here. Effectively, he crucified regulators for being too old-fashioned and adhering to rules that were made for the post-World War II industrialized West. He specifically blasted the Basel Accords, a set of rules setting out capital reserve requirements for financial institutions as medicine that is not appropriate for today's China. He described the banks as having a pawn shop mentality and the regulators as being too academic, too far away from the market. I personally use the word audacious to describe his words, but I was probably being diplomatic, which he was definitely not. The public's reaction was more negative than positive, although it hadn't quite reached fever pitch. Jack Ma is famously controversial and is no stranger to getting slammed by public opinion, especially when he espouses views that are clearly pro-capitalist, such as when he came out in defense of 996 overwork culture earlier this year. So no one really thought it was a harbinger of things to come. 
it was just your usual Jack being Jack. As more information came out and people realized how much Ant's credit tech business relied on leverage, however, and especially after watching hyperbolic videos such as this one, their views would sour further. Now, the Bun Summit wasn't any old conference. Jack Ma was one of the least important people there on the day he spoke, which is the first full day. The opening remarks were given by Wang Qishen, China's vice president, so you can imagine the caliber of attendees. Every current and ex-central banker of note was there, and select top-level international guests joined virtually, including the noted China bull, Mr. Ray Dalio. Jack Ma was not introduced in his business band capacity as co-founder of Alibaba and Ant, but instead as co-chair of the UN High-Level Panel on Digital Cooperation and United Nations SDG Advocate. Ant's chairman, Eric Jing, by the way, spoke on the second day of the conference, and his presentation was on Ant and its achievements, particularly its partnerships with traditional banks. No other fintech competitor was invited. So if you think Ant doesn't have the sector's best government relationships and recognition from regulators, think again. So I'm inclined to believe that Jack et al. were very much in the know about the proposed regulations coming down the pipeline. I mean, it is well known that he was prepared to go to jail when he started Alipay, even telling his team that they needed to have a list of who else would go after him, should his presence be insufficient, and so on and so on. Even if he somehow began to feel that Ant was too big to touch, which it really wasn't, the P2P and university loan scandals would have been seen as warning signs, as would have been the various antitrust investigations earlier this summer. By the way, they were pushed out with greater force today. Ant should be interfacing with the regulators constantly, since they are such an important stakeholder and because they have so many other issues under negotiation with the government. One, the transactional data they collect for one, which is still proprietary. And two, credit data, which still seems to be incompletely incorporated into China's personal credit system. By the way, we talk a little bit about how difficult it has been in the episode we did on Ant. That, and just look at how many ex-PBOC staffers they've hired, as any smart company would do. It would also explain how pointedly Jack's speech seems to have been aimed towards cutting down those regulations that were announced on the same day he was called in for tea. In fact, we also know that just this August, Ant secured a consumer finance license for $600 million. Now, it's not the most flexible license, and it's mostly held by a handful of banks and retailers. But it was a curious piece of news that was mostly buried in the IPO hype. And now you ask, what are the new rules? And now on to the new rules. But what were the regulations that were announced? Well, they are draft rules, and they are here. For Ant, the proposals of concerns are, one, limiting low amounts to $45,000 per individual, or the average of their last three years' income, and $150,000 per business. Two, the microlender must put up 30% of the capital. The loan amount limits do not affect Ant as much as its business currently stays within these limits. Diebei, the loan product, maxes out at $45,000, but could be construed to limit future growth. The capital requirement is the real killer. In the case of Ant, Huabei and Jiebei are each micro-lending companies registered in the city of Chongqing, and neither have put up remotely close to 30% of the capital. Now, Chongqing is a city in western China directly reporting to the central government. It's one of four alongside Beijing, Shanghai, and Tianjin. Jack couldn't get a license from anyone else back in 2014 when he started this business. According to the former mayor of Chongqing, Huang Qifan, who spoke immediately after Eric Jing at the Bun Summit and is a very important person in finance in China, he approved it because as long as Jack wasn't doing P2P, which he hated, he didn't see a problem. 
Not only Ant, but all of Ant's competitors quickly established micro lending companies there. Right after Jack's speech, folks quickly dug out Huang's other speeches, including this one originally from June and republished on October 28th, where he explained in detail how Ant was able to get such a high effective leverage using so little capital. The TLDR is, the three regulatory bodies were not equipped to deal with internet-based micro-lending, and while their rules regarding capital requirements were indeed observed, because the rules were made under the assumption that it would take months to deploy any capital raised or borrowed, not mere days, it actually allowed for the 100-time expansion that Ant was initially able to achieve. By the time the regulatory agencies were in agreement about what to do, Ant had already lent out tens of billions of dollars in debt. And most of that, 98% is the most current measure, were sold to banks and other financial institutions in the form of ABS, or asset-backed securities. Obviously, this needed to be halted. Huang's account seemed to indicate that Ant voluntarily took down its leverage to 3x, it was actually offered 4x, again providing evidence that it is very much working in tandem with regulators and not against. In Ant's prospectus, it is noted that this took place sometime in 2018. This would match up with what has been reported in Chinese media this week, which is that Ant had only sought $12 billion of worth of ABS this year, with $8 billion already approved. Of course, the implication is that they may be pulled as well, given the new regulations. So remember, the outrageous 100 times leverage has not, in fact, been available since 2018. It would explain why it was not part of the new draft regulations. That part had already been resolved. And here we have a colorful video from Huang, which explains it thusly. Anne had about $400 million in capital, which it took to the bank and borrowed eight to $900 million against, which is allowed since banks can lend at a ratio of one to two X or so. So now it has about 1.2 billion, which it went to the market and sold as asset-backed securities. But because there was no limit on how many times you could go to the ABS market, you could do this as fast as you could get it loaned out, which for Ant, using the internet was a matter of days. So that $1.2 billion became an aspect security 40 times, which is how Ant was able to get $50 billion plus of loans with just $400 million in starting capital. However, this doesn't mean that Ant had filled in the gaping capital hole that it had created. The accepted leverage by the PBOC is 10 times, and this had clearly exceeded that. Depending on how the new rules are implemented, Ant is looking at a capital shortfall of at least $20 billion, as laid out per Chinese analysts. That's substantial, even for what would have been the world's largest IPO at $35 billion. With these new rules, it also makes sense that the market would have to seriously reconsider valuing Ant as a financial services company instead of a tech one a fact it was pushing hard against during the IPO roadshow, despite already having been designated by the government as a financial holding company in September. And now the regulators. I know there were some investors who were paying close attention and were already doubting the viability of the IPO in mid-October in private. But the speech by Jack brought it to the forefront and required a response. In the week following, a series of three extremely articulate and pro-regulation op-eds appeared in the state-owned media for the financial industry. They were signed with pseudonyms, but believed to be the work of Zhou Xiaochun, who is ex-PBOC, Zhang Tao, who is at the IMF, and Chen Yulu, who is at the PBOC. By the way, there are more non-anonymous ones from Guo Wuping of the CBIRC, for example, that call out Huabei and Jiebei by name as infringing on consumer rights. Now, I do not follow the work of these gentlemen and do not have an opinion one way or the other, but the essay's contents make it clear. There are many deficiencies of the current Chinese financial system, but that does not mean big tech, and the piece believed to be written by Zhang uses his English word extensively, 
gets to do what it wants, even if we can acknowledge their contributions to society. So the TLDR is, we like innovation, but let's not overhype the magic of big data. And anyway, you're still operating in financial services, so that's how you're going to be regulated, like it or not. That's because if we, the regulators, don't step in and something goes wrong, who will pay the price? Society will. The citizens will. Don't you guys remember the great financial crisis of 2008? A few parties won, yes, but all the rest of us, we lost. We were all set back. That's not happening again, not on our watch. And that is the chord that struck with the citizens in China. China has beat COVID, yes, for the most part. But it's not like there's euphoria. Most people are thinking, gosh, it could be much, much worse. Things feel fragile, and there's little willingness to tolerate any risk that could precipitate an economic crisis, especially one that could have been prevented by the regulators. Whether or not this is the actual right step to take, I mean, do these rules really do anything other than ring in fintech and Do they possibly push the country towards more shadow banking, among other risks, is not top of mind for the average citizen. It must have been, however, for the regulators. Ultimately, though, it seems that they decided more regulation was better than less. But why now? And now we come to the biggest riddle of all. I hope I've given you enough context on why the regulators wanted to step in and why the citizens were in support. But that still doesn't explain why the IPO was halted literally two days before the listing. As Reuters reported, there are folks with knowledge of the deal who say that it was due to outrage at Jack Ma's comments. The regulators were personally offended and retaliated because they were thin-skinned. I can believe that. Jack wasn't kind. More importantly, as I quoted in my article for Tortoise Media, Western experts thought this was an indication of the government's capriciousness and unreliability. China doesn't know what it's doing, as one op-ed columnist wrote in the provocatively titled, and suspended IPO turns Jack Ma into Ray Dalio's worst nightmare. Ray Dalio, by the way, has since responded, nope. But was that how it was actually perceived on the ground in China and by those seeking to do business in China? I turned to the many China-focused investors I've now come to know as part of doing tech buzz, as well as some old friends from Venture, and asked them if they felt the same. Nope. Hmm. Interesting, I thought. How about Chinese entrepreneurs and engineers? Or normal, everyday folk? Nope. No matter who I asked, no one thought it was to upstage Jack Ma specifically, and everyone thought this was a good move. Many thought his speech was made out of desperation, a last-ditch attempt to sway public opinion, which failed. No one gets to Jack's level in China without having some major cunning, they explained. The regulators would be people he knew well, not once he was still feeling out. The hot-headedness is an indiscriminate, It was strategic. If it put him in the line of fire, that was because he knew which buttons he was pressing. A few even believed this was a stunt, fully coordinated by Jack and the regulators in order to legitimize Ant while crushing the rest of the industry. As an aside, that seems too 5D chess for me. Either way, it didn't matter because there was every reason the government should step in to stop the greed on the part of Ant, and on the part of everyone in that micro-lending business. Thank goodness the government did so before the public bore the losses, they said, pretty uniformly. Kind of true. Even if you weren't planning to buy Ant shares, you could have been an indirect shareholder of sorts. As Chairman Eric J noted at the beginning of the Bun Summit speech, hello to our big shareholder, the Social Security Fund sitting in the audience. Furthermore, Every single Chinese person said, why would the government need to go to such lengths to punish Jack Ma? Couldn't they just say he had an issue with his taxes or something like that? As for why the last minute halt, that's simple enough. There are so many competing and conflicting interests amongst these agencies. 
I mean, it's embarrassing that it got down to the wire as it did, but better to have reversed course than to have the public holding the bag for the sake of saving face and trying to be the biggest IPO. Isn't that interesting? You could use the concept of saving face in these two directly opposing ways, and yet explain the situation to your satisfaction. It wasn't surprising to have the public support the eleventh hour halt, but it was surprising to me how many investors and finance professionals, whose livelihoods depend on a well-functioning capital market, thought the same. But as someone pointed out on Twitter, this could be one of those reflexivity things—a self-fulfilling prophecy. If the people putting money into the market and actively participating in it believe the regulators to be acting for their good, for the good of the market, for the good of society, then does it really matter what anyone else thinks? And finally, for some last bits, versus trying to figure out what exactly happened at Ant, whose valuation will almost certainly be discounted, maybe even halved, most folks I know have already moved on. After all, the IPO, if it's revived, is not likely for another six months at least. Although no one I spoke to seriously thought it would be shelved forever, there are many more immediate problems at hand. For one, what's the impact to Alibaba and other e-commerce, all of whom benefited from the spigot of easy consumer credit, and other retail players? What about all the advertising-based platforms who are raking in the dough from all the micro-lending marketing campaigns? And so on, and so on, and there are so many other risks coming too. The regulators are clearly just getting started and getting down and dirty with big tech, as a set of antitrust draft laws came out today. They are now explicitly forbidden from all sorts of anti-competitive behavior that all the platforms have been engaging in for years, such as exclusivity or outright banning, and of course all manner of crazy subsidies. It was something I didn't think was ever going to change, but what do you know? They're here, and if there's anything I learned from this ant IPO halt, it's that I'm not going to assume that I know how all the stakeholders are going to feel about it. At least, not just based on what makes sense to me.